All right. Well, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Um, hope everybody. Uh, last but not least, here we'll press forward. Uh, talk about um, two major flash flood events that occurred across the northern mid Atlantic region of the um, eastern half of the United States and significantly impacted the uh, the Binghamton uh, Weather Forecast Office area of responsibility, which encompasses much of central New York and uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. I will state right off uh, right off the top here that. Uh, these events were not um, isolated to the Binghamton forecast area specifically. Um, they did occur, or they did impact a vast majority of um, uh, the northern mid-Atlantic region to include the Philadelphia State College, Albany, uh, and even the New York City metro areas um, as these two events unfolded. So um, as I went and started looking into both events, uh, it was quite apparent that there were Quite a few similarities between two of both events, and uh, we're currently in the re process right now of uh, trying to document uh, uh, both cases um, uh, for future reference. Um, but um, Dave Riddell at Eastern Region SSD uh, gave me a gave me a pretty good idea to go ahead and look at these uh, cases, looking at some of the experimental uh, satellite products. Um, uh, that really uh, highlighted the um, tropical connections for both events and. Uh, so uh, the overview, we'll talk about both the June 2006 and September 2011 um, floods. We'll give a brief event review. We'll also review some of the, uh, uh, we'll also review the blended TPW satellite um, uh, imagery that is now available to us within the National Weather Service here in the States. Um, I'm not sure if it's available to you guys up in Canada. Um, however, I will uh, give you guys website addresses where you guys can actually look at this uh, just right on the, uh, um, just right through the internet. And we'll briefly review atmospheric rivers and satellite identification of such features, and uh, we'll show how the um, atmospheric rivers led to pretty catastrophic flooding um, with both the June 2006 and September 2011 events. So the June 2006 event, uh, uh, major flooding occurred along the east coast of the United States from um, pretty much the Adirondack Mountains south all the way through eastern portions of um, uh, Pennsylvania down even into the greater Washington, D.C. area. Um, major flooding occurred across the Susquehanna River Valley Basin in um, central New York and um, northeastern Pennsylvania all the way down to the Maryland border, really. Um, as we'll see in subsequent slides, there's a well-established tropical connection. And uh, this was an, an event that actually lasted for several days. We had several rounds of very heavy rainfall that moved over the area uh, during a three- to four-day period. Um, by the end of the event, there was anywhere between 10 to 15 inches of uh, rain that was recorded across the Binghamton forecast area. Uh, we, and we did receive record flooding um, uh, on our area rivers. In fact, 36 of the Mid-Atlantic River Forecast Center River Forecast points were at or above major flood stage and multiple records were set. Across the Binghamton area specifically, we estimated over $1 billion worth of damage. And this, the graphic on the bottom right is an estimated uh, rainfall um, uh, graphic and you can see the isolated amounts over the Catskills and Susquehanna Valley in, nor in northern, northeastern Pennsylvania where we were looking at um, anywhere between six to eight inches of rain uh, from a 12 to 24 hour period. Trying to move forward here. And so just kind of give you guys a general idea what the synoptic situation was. We had a fairly uh, um, a long wave trough extending all the way from central Wisconsin down to the deep south of the United States. Uh, you can see across the eastern seaboard on the left graphic there that much of the eastern half of the United States uh, was uh, enveloped in uh, southwest flow aloft. Uh, deep meridional, meridional transport along the eastern seaboard. Um, the graphic on the right uh, is the mean sea level pressure, and I apologize if it might be hard to see, but this is the RUC, 80, uh, the RUC uh, forecast, initial hour forecast valid at uh, uh, 6 z on the 28th of June 2006, and we have a surface low pressure system uh, just south of the uh, capital uh, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. area, and this gradually lifted north throughout the overnight period up into uh, New England. Um, also, uh, you can see over here on the far left, we had an upper-level shortwave trough here across the Delmarva Peninsula area, and uh, this continued to also work north along the east coast uh, throughout the overnight period and um, associated lift so with that feature combined with the uh, northward lifting of a mesolow low here across um, 
Uh, the lower mid-Atlantic region resulted in pretty extensive rainfall during that uh, overnight period across the eastern half of the uh, U.S. In a loft, um, we had a rather significant upper level ridging across the eastern half of, or I'm sorry, the northern portions of the, the northern Atlantic, and we had a really well established um, anti cyclonically curved upper level jet uh, across uh, southern Ontario down into um, uh, the eastern Great Lakes region. And it might be hard to see, and I apologize for that, but uh, much of um, uh, eastern portions of Pennsylvania up in the uh, central and northern New York were placed under pretty decent upper level divergence aloft. Press forward. The September 2011 event, again, major river flooding along the Susquehanna Valley region of um, uh, upstate New York in the eastern portions of Pennsylvania. This was a little different in the sense that um, uh, the, tropo the, the first tropical connection um, was really associated with the remnant tropical storm Lee circulation that made landfall, I believe, on the 3rd of September down across Louisiana and gradually meandered its way up in the uh, lower Ohio River Valley by the morning of, of 7 September. Um, so we got quite a bit of uh, tr um, tropical moisture associated with that feature. Plus we had Hurricane Katia that was off the east coast uh, down towards Bermuda during this time frame as well. And um, uh, looking at uh, several uh, satellite animations, it became relatively apparent that uh, there's a tropical connection associated with that feature as well. And we'll look at that in subsequent slides as well. Uh, by the time this event was over across the Binghamton forecast area, anywhere between 12 to 13 inches of rain had fallen over the Binghamton forecast area. Just west of the Binghamton uh, metropolitan area, you can see here on the, uh, on the graphic in the lower right, we had in excess of 10 inches of rain. I think, if I'm not mistaken, our, our total was about 12 inches down across Tioga Terrace, which is directly uh, west of uh, downtown Binghamton along the Route 17 corridor. Uh, major flooding. Um, we had very moist antecedent conditions uh, prior to this event. Uh, just a week prior, we had Hurricane, Ir um, Hurricane Irene uh, roll up the eastern coast or the east coast, which led to catastrophic flooding across much of uh, uh, Vermont, portions of uh, western uh, Massachusetts, eastern New York, even down into eastern portions of the Catskills as well. So this was pretty much a, uh, uh, a one-two punch um, with uh, two tropical systems impacting the area within a week's time frame. Um, 32 river points um, were either at or above a major flood stage. Um, interestingly enough, um, the all-time record high river crest uh, at Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania was set on the, uh, shortly after this event occurred. It, um, it surpassed the level set back in 1972 by the remnants of uh, Hurricane Agnes, which is typically the benchmark for the Susquehanna River Basin with respect to river flooding. Uh, many records that were sent that were set back in the, 2000, the June 2006 event were surpassed uh, when the September 11 event occurred, and uh, by the events end, uh, there was greater than 1.2 billion dollars worth of estimated damage. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the heavy rainfall and subsequent flooding led to 10 fatalities across uh, portions of Pennsylvania um, as uh, floodwaters impacted uh, a good portion of the good portion of the state. So uh, synoptic uh, scale, briefly again, uh, look over on the far left here, hand graphic, the remnant uh, tropical storm Lee circulation spinning across the lower Ohio Valley. Um, also look across the um, uh, western portions of the Atlantic south of Bermuda there, that's uh, Hurricane Katia circulation that uh, continued to spin throughout the duration of the event as well. And we'll see in subsequent slides how moisture associated with this feature continued to work northwest with time throughout the event, which led to heavy rainfall southeast of the Binghamton forecast area. Um, uh, along the surface, the image on the right here, uh, surface low pressure systems centered near Johnson City, Tennessee, eastern portions of Kentucky there, uh, gradually lifted northward with time um, uh, throughout the day as the heavy rainfall impacted a, a vast majority of the eastern, the northern mid-Atlantic region. And, uh, um, it was really interesting in the sense that there's been uh, one of my uh, co-partners uh, at the Binghamton office did a study with Lance Bozar from uh, SUNY Albany that uh, really indicates that uh, the presence of Hurricane Katia south of Bermuda likely strengthened the upper level ridge here uh, to the north across the northern Atlantic. And we'll see with the, um, that as a result of that, uh, um, if I can get this still present to move here, here we go. 
uh, it really strengthened the anticyclonically curved upper level jet over the northern mid Atlantic again and produced a rather extensive upper level divergence across much of the northern mid Atlantic, uh, creating very, uh, um, very good conditions for strong upper level uh, forcing, uh, which resulted in a pretty catastrophic rainfall. So, uh, moving on here. So, talking about some of the um, the satellite um, uh, imagery that was available to us for both events, um, well, specifically for the September 2011 event, it was still in a experimental phase back in 2006. And I got to thank uh, publicly thank um, uh, Sheldon Kusselson from NOAA NESDIS, who was able to um, archive some of the 2006 data and uh, shared it with me uh, for the preparation of this presentation. Uh, but this is the blended uh, TPW uh, total precipitable water product that is now available to us in the National Weather Service. And uh, this these image, these uh, next couple of slides are actually from um, Shelvin, and it kind of shows, if you will, um, a blending of multiple. I apologize, it went forward. I mean, I didn't mean it to do that. From multiple uh, satellite, satellite sources, um, uh, DMSP the. Uh, uh, defense meteorological satellite platforms um, are ingesting uh, TPW data as well as um, some of the NOAA polar orbiters which are also um, ingesting some of this data as well. And over the CONUS locations uh, we're actually getting TPW data from uh, the GPS uh, MET on some of the satellites and um, also from uh, the GPS stations across um, uh, ground stations that are located across uh, the United States as well. And when it all merged together, we get we can get a merged product, and uh, we can see that on the next slide here. Um, uh, multi or multi sensors are merged into one product, and we get a uh, continuous um, uh, depiction of what the tropical moisture is, the the total precipitable water is across the the entire world, if you will even over land surfaces, which wasn't available uh, in the not too distant past. So, um, and uh, obviously um, the higher values uh, indicate higher um, concentrations of um, uh, moisture and we're able to trace these in real time um, to show uh, narrow corridors of um, tropical moisture impinging upon specific locations which can give an indication of where the atmospheric rivers are, are setting up and uh, we'll talk about those in uh, in, in the near future here as well. So, so what this all means to us in, in the Weather Service and Environment Canada and you know worldwide operations um, is um, we're getting an increased amount of data that we can um, use to highlight um, you know those the events that are um, um, out of the ordinary and uh, we could potentially use that data to uh, get warnings out quicker when we see conditions become favorable for a rather catastrophic event. So the to as I tried to show on the last page, uh, the blended TPW product is merging all the, uh, the TPW products from all the different satellites into one um, unified product. And we can see here, um, you know, just looking at the continental U.S. to include uh, Canada as well, uh, that multiple data sets or multiple inputs are coming from the satellites and being merged all into one uh, unified product and uh, you're able to actually trace where the high uh, moisture content air is and where it could potentially be impinging uh, across um, uh, portions of uh, your area of interest obviously. So it's going to be available in AWIS 2, it's already available in AWIS for the National Weather Service users. Um, for Environment Canada folks, um, if you guys are interested, it's available from these websites um, as well. Um, in fact, I was on the experimental uh, page today and it actually shows contributions from all three satellite sources independently. So uh, you guys can look at that and you know see the unified product as well as all the contributions from the three individual product, satellite products as well. So atmospheric rivers, um, I'm sure this is a term that uh, most people are pretty familiar with, but uh, uh, if you aren't, atmospheric rivers in general just are really uh, narrow moisture-laden airstreams um, located in the warm sector of extratropical cyclones. Their average width is approximately 400 kilometers or so. Um, however, the, the main impetus, if you will, on uh, why these are significant is 
that they're really responsible for greater than 90% of the horizontal tr um, moisture transport within the mid-latitude. So um, a lot of research um, that was done across the western coast or, or the west coast of the United States to include, I think, as far north as the Pacific Northwest and potentially even Canada, if I'm not mistaken, um, has shown how it, the detection and tracking of atmospheric rivers can provide a lot of situational awareness with respect to uh, uh, whether or not heavy rainfall and potential flash flooding uh, can occur across it, your area of interest. Um, seeing a high correlation of uh, significant flash flooding with atmospheric rivers as they start impinging upon uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains across uh, uh, California as well as uh, uh, the Cascades and Olympic Mountains uh, in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest as well. And fortunately, uh, the atmospheric rivers are uh, identifiable from uh, uh, the blended TPW product, and, and we'll see that uh, in the next couple of slides for the September 2011 and June 2006 events. So, uh, re it really helps uh, establish whether or not there's a low-level deep tropical connection, and if there is, it could raise your situational awareness for uh, impending uh, flood operations or flooding conditions if uh, the remaining uh, conditions are favorable. I like to state um, uh, Sheldon Kusselson from Noah Nezis. He likes to um, really try to hammer this in when he gives a presentation that shows um, um, blended TPW products. Um, um, the blended TPW products are showing you uh, uh, the, the vertical moisture contribution pretty much from like 500 millibars down towards the surface. So it's really a great indicator of what the low level moisture content is within the air, uh, within the troposphere, whereas water vapor in general many of us probably know are uh, more concentrated from usually 400 millibars on up. So when you use water vapor imagery, you're really looking at the middle troposphere and, uh, and up towards the, or the middle of the upper portions of the troposphere. So by using both of these in tandem with one another, you're, you're getting a more accurate representation of what the total atmospheric um, contribution is throughout the entire depth of the troposphere. So this is the June 2006 event, and I hope this animation, I try to slow it down, uh, for you guys uh, is coming across okay, and I apologize up front if it's not. Um, if anybody's interested, I'll be happy to send this presentation to them uh, for review. But uh, on the left image, we're seeing the um, water vapor imagery for the June 2006 event. And this loop is really a three-day loop uh, running from the 25th of June through um, uh, 2315 on the 27th of June. And we're seeing that there's quite a bit of upper level moisture. And like I said, said previously, this is really for 400 millibar, 400 millibars in up. So we're seeing the upper level um, uh, uh, moisture contribution. However, if you look over here, um, the top right here, this is the low level moisture contribution uh, discernible from the blended TPW product, which was that experimental. And again, special thanks to Sheldon Kusselson for uh, sharing this data with me. But it really shows with time how this uh, low-level tropical moisture connection uh, really becomes established across the eastern half of the United States and filters right up to the northern mid-Atlantic. And obviously, this is where we had significant flash flooding occur. So um, you're getting the total moisture, the total tropospheric moisture contribution by inspecting both graphics or both images uh, concurrently. Again, special thanks to Sheldon. And trying to get to the next slide. Uh, for the September 2011 event, again, on the left-hand side, we got the upper-level moisture contribution from the uh, water vapor imagery, again, showing um, a fairly ex extensive amount of upper-level moisture prevalent across the eastern seaboard. Um, a little bit more blocky in nature, and I apologize for that, not as smooth. Um, this is a really, unfortunately, it's on a 16-kilometer grid, and I think uh, with the next version, uh, the grid's um, resolution is actually going to be decreased, so it should be a little bit more, um, um, not a little bit less blocky, if you will. But uh, we can see with time that we get the tropical moisture connection once again across the eastern half of the United States, gradually feeding up into the central and northern mid Atlantic regions. And, how, and also look at the, tropical, or the Hurricane Katia circulation here. Uh, across the eastern half, or I'm sorry, the, the southern portions of the Atlantic Ocean, and you can see that the outflow is um, moving northwest and with time up towards the northern mid Atlantic region. And it appears from our vantage point that uh, um, there was an, an additional tropical moisture source working northwestward with time uh, towards the northern mid Atlantic region. 
And um, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but uh, there was also, uh, for both events, there appeared to be a little uh, coastal frontal boundary that was apparent on, on um, the surface, which also led to some low-level frontogenesis, and ultimately everything came together to create favorable conditions for pretty, for, um, pretty catastrophic uh, flash flood event across the northern mid-Atlantic region. So you can see the merging of the two tropical air streams with time. Um, it, we think uh, we think that the second moisture source from Hurricane Katia really helped uh, lead to some pretty significant flash flooding across portions of uh, New Jersey, southern southeastern New York, just north of New York City, into western portions of uh, Connecticut. Um, while um, the more uh, north south orientation low level moisture feed originating from um, uh, looks like the the Caribbean up through southern, central portions of Florida and the western Atlantic there appeared to be the main contributing factor for uh, uh, the heavy rainfall and flash flooding that occurred across the Binghamton forecast area. So, so in conclusion, um, we had two separate East Coast record-setting record uh, flash flood events, um, both June 2006 and September 2011 event. Um, in September 11, uh, many river uh, stage um, benchmarks that were set back in 2006 were easily surpassed, setting all-time records for uh, several river forecast points um, throughout the Mid-Atlantic River Forecast Center's area of responsibility. Uh, both events displayed deep meridional flow along the East Coast. Um, there's enhanced low-level moisture transport with the Bermuda High off the East Coast and also a merging of the, tro the uh, tropical moisture uh, from both the remnant hurricane storm Lee or tropical storm Lee that was spinning across the Ohio Valley and uh, Hurricane Katia that was across the Western Atlantic uh, for the September 2011 event. Didn't really get into too much detail here, um, but uh, there appeared to be um, uh, a, a contribution from a uh, uh, coastal front for both events as well, that, which led to some low-level frontogenesis and isentropic ascent northwest up into the northern mid-Atlantic region as well. And uh, what was really apparent was uh, both events displayed very strong anticyclonically curved jets north of the flash flood region, which, uh, um, based on the, um, the direct thermal or the thermal circulate direct thermal circulation, uh, led to uh, rather strong upward level divergence across the flash flood region, uh, which likely also enhanced low level moisture transport as well as a low level jet increase uh, on the southern edge of the direct thermal circulation on the entrance region of that upper level jet. And the integrated water vapor blended TPW um, imagery that was that we had available for both events clearly showed the tropical connection uh, that was uh, established along the eastern seaboard for uh, for both events. And from our opinion, it appears that both events were easily classified as atmospheric rivers as uh, um, the tropical air mass or, or the air stream that was coming up into the east northeastern US obviously had uh, deep tropical characteristics. Um, and that can serve as a potential warning sign for uh, future forecasters when they're dealing with uh, future uh, events of similar proportions, so through pattern recognition. And I think that should be it. Uh, that's a view of uh, uh, the Greater Binghamton area from the air. That's Lord's Hospital, which is just north of the Susquehanna River. And um, I believe back in 2006 it was flooded out, if I'm not mistaken. It was before I got to this office. And uh, luckily they built a flood wall um, between the 2006 event and the 2011 event, which um, ultimately helped them out quite considerably, as you can see from this image, uh, during the 2011 event. So uh, that's it for me.